Hello, everyone. Um, I am, we are just opening up the webinar. And so we're just going to take a few moments to allow people to join. And as you come in, please take a minute and uh, look at some of the resources that we have going across the screen. And in just a moment, we will do some introductions and get right to the program. Wonderful, we have about 32 people here right now. So um, we'll wait just a few more minutes. We're expecting quite a few more. Welcome, thank you for taking out um, one of, I think one of the more sunny days in the next few days. So thank you for taking the time for being here. Hoping everybody can see that screen okay, correct? Might need to move your, your panelists around your screen a little bit to see the whole thing. Again, welcome everybody. We're just waiting for everybody to join us and we'll get started as soon as possible. I just wanna uh, point out that there's two different um, ways that you can communicate with the panel. One is through a chat, which is a uh, public chat. So anything you post there can be seen by everyone or you can direct it to one of the panelists. Additionally, there's a Q&A button. That is a confidential button there that you can ask questions and we will cover those questions either during the presentation or we will uh, do a Q&A at the end and hopefully answer any questions that you may have. So again, welcome and um, we'll give it just one more minute. I'm hearing from a panelist that the, the uh, chat button seems to be disabled. So we will work on that behind the scenes. Um, so if that's the case and you have something that you wanna say, please type in the Q&A and we'll work on that chat function. Thank you, Kevin. Seems as though the uh, PowerPoint has uh, frozen. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing right now so we can all see each other nice and bright. Um, let's see, I do see the chat here. Just wanna make sure it's all set. So anybody who wants to have a public conversation or engage with the community can use the chat button. If you have a private Q&A, um, you um, are welcome to type into there. We already have a question about whether the panelists will be available later this evening. Um, I think that question is in regard to, will we stay on for a few minutes at the end to see if there's other more confidential questions that people might wanna have answered? The answer is yes, we will do that uh, confidentially by using the Q&A section and try and answer those questions um, at the very end. So thank you for that. And we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, welcome, my name's Elaine Dano and I'm the Director of Human Services for the Town of Westport. We are so happy to have you here today. Um, I'm here with a, a really wonderful panel of people. So I'm just gonna start, well, I guess at my top left since <laughs> I don't know if everybody's screen looks the same, but um, you know, as, as you know, um, in, a, in our community, we really work closely with the school system. Um, we have a, an organization called Westport Together, which really engages various community organizations 
in really working for the betterment of children and families in town. Um, and to that end, we have Dr. Valerie Babich, who is the Director of Psych Services for the Westport Public School System. Um, Val and uh, Human Services works very closely together to um, you know, really capture kids and families both at school and in the community. Uh, additionally, we have my colleague, Deirdre Eckholt, who is a licensed um, social worker and um, working for the town of Westport, and she does specialize in adolescents. And so she's going to be working with us and monitoring the, uh, the chat and the Q&A section as we go through the program. Um, I want to give a quick shout out to Alex Giannani from the Westport Library, who's been awesome in helping us to put all this together technologically. So thank you, Alex. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to introduce our esteemed panelists. Um, again, we're really thrilled to have you here today, and we appreciate that um, it's been a difficult time in Westport. We've been through some really significant trauma, and I know that there's a lot of parents and a, really a lot of people in general that are just looking for some guidance and some um, more information about how to talk to our kids about, you know, the things that we see in the news. So we welcome you and we thank you for your time. Um, our speakers today include Dr. Andrew Gerber. Dr. Gerber is the president and medical director of Silver Hill Hospital, which is a nonprofit psychiatric hospital in New Canaan, Connecticut. Uh, Dr. Gerber is a child and adolescent psychiatrist whose career combines his work as a clin clinician, scholar, research scientist, and executive. Um, he completed his medical and psychiatric training at Harvard Medical School, Cambridge Hospital, Weill Cornell, and, Cornell, and Columbia Medical School. He has his PhD in psychology um, from the University College of London and Anna Freud Center. Um, he has many affiliations, uh, including the associate clinical professor in the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at Columbia University Medical Center and an associate clinical professor at Child Study Center and Department of Psychiatry at Yale University. Welcome, Dr. Gerber, and I don't think you sleep, so thanks for staying up late for us today. Um, we also have uh, Dr. Stefan Zanakis, um, who is uh, a Brigadier General, actually, a retired from the retired U.S. Army. He's an adult, child, and adolescent psychiatrist with many years of clinical, academic, and management experience. Dr. Zanakis was commissioned during the Vietnam War and retired from the U.S. Army in 1988 at the rank of Brigadier General. He's advised the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and other senior Department of Defense officials on psychological health, the effects of blast concussions, PTSD, and suicide prevention. Dr. Zanakis has numerous medical publications and is an adjunct professor at the Uniform Services of Health Sciences of the Military Medical Department on the Executive Board of the Center for Ethics and Rule of Law at the University of Pennsylvania Law School, and he is a graduate of Princeton University and the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Thank you for being here, Doctor. And and will you just correct me? I know I'm not saying it right. I keep saying Zanakis, but it is. It's Xenakis. Or I mean, we've anglicized it, but it's uh, in Greek. It's Xenakis. Thanks. Xenakis. Xenakis. I'm going to do better next time. Oh, and no. thank you for your service oh. as well. <laughs> um, and we also have Dat, uh, uh, Matt uh, Dinabertis. Um, who is a community resilience campaign coach at Silver Hill Hospital. He, in, in conjunction with the Department of Defense, Matt's experience includes training at the U.S. Army soldiers and families in resilience and psychological skill building in Fort Hood, Texas. Matt was responsible for developing curriculum and executing high impact training for company sized elements, which led to enhanced performance outcomes and lower behavioral incidents. As a degree holder in psychology and sports psychology, Matt supports the campaign as a subject matter expert in resilience training and performance psychology. Matt's a certified police officer standards and training council instructor and has had the honor of consulting with business leaders, professional athletes, and division one student athletes and coaches. Welcome Matt. And Matt will be working with us on some of the more tangible strategies that we might use um, around resilience. So welcome, we're happy to have you. And then finally, I don't have a long um, write-up on Tara, but Tara Reed it seems to be a jack of all trades. She's an RN and she is also the community resilience um, community rep. 
So she is, um, we're very happy to have her here to help us sort of coordinate this whole thing and she'll be um, doing the Q&A at the end. So again, welcome. Without further ado, I'm gonna pass the, the mic, so to speak, um, over to Dr. Zanikis to um, get us started. And Matt is going to share the slides. So thank you all. Well, thanks, Elaine. Uh, thanks for a very kind introduction. And my hat's off to you, Val, and your team uh, for bringing everybody together tonight. Uh, so great, look, it's a great credit to you and to your leadership, your community, in showing the outreach that you do and the concern for everybody and making this an open forum and giving everyone the opportunity to come together uh, this has been a tough year for all of us. Uh, and uh, it uh, now we have this very sad, tragic incident that comes in the middle of that. And we just imagine uh, what it means uh, for everyone uh, when this happens to us and the impact it has on us uh, individually, the impact it has on our families, our communities, and as we try and think about how we're going to uh, continue to live our lives and as parents, how we're gonna to continue to help our children and everybody else. So I, uh, we've put this campaign together uh, about now 15 months ago, and we were very fortunate to have the support and leadership of Dr. Gerber, his staff and his board uh, that recognized that as COVID was coming upon us, uh, that this was going to have a long and stressful impact on all of us and that we needed to be proactive uh, to do that, uh, to help out and support. Uh, my experience in the military, of course, has been that our effectiveness uh, as a, or particularly as an army, uh, has been that we've kept our soldiers and our families as physically healthy as we can and as mentally healthy. They've been under a lot of stress and then something happens. And of course, incidents like this happen to our military families and it just sets things off and can turn very bad. And uh, our, our responsibility, I felt our, our duty, our obligation as military uh, health uh, leaders and practitioners has been to do everything we can to keep everybody healthy. And these kinds of forums are very, very important. So I really wanna commend you again for doing this and putting this together, because that's what we're trying to do here. Uh, we want to do what is best and uh, we'll go through some things. There's some ideas here that we're gonna talk about. Uh, we really want to hear from you if they are helpful or not helpful or what we can do that's better. Uh, I have to say for the, I hate to think of it, the 50 years or so that I've been doing this, as you said, I came in during the Vietnam War, I was commissioned in 1970 and I really maintained a connection uh, with the military all these years, I continue to be involved. Uh, I've seen us try and do our best in a various ways. Uh, there is no magic. I'd like to think that there was or that there was a formula. Uh, what works best is what you've already done, which is you said there's a commitment. Uh, we're gonna open this up. We're gonna have back and forth communication there are some ideas here and we're gonna make, we're gonna see how they best work. So that's what our intent is here. Uh, we'll do this as an introduction and we are open to meeting and talking with people individually uh, as the months unfold. Not, because, not only this, but as other things you know that are happening in our, in our lives and we'll see how this pandemic plays out. Uh, so that's the basis of what we've put together for this uh, campaign. Uh, next slide. Uh, what we want to talk about is essentially not only the is the stress and anxiety. 
because that really is the, the environment uh, that when a traumatic event like this occurs, uh, really sets things off. And uh, how do we best manage as parents, uh, as teachers or as professionals, how do we best help manage that stress and anxiety and particularly help those people that are most vulnerable. And as you, we all know, and we're all worried about our children are most vulnerable and our students are most vulnerable. So what are the, what are the thoughts we need to have? How do an approach here? What's the kind of plan that works best? Uh, that, and this is going to continue. Uh, I don't see, I hope I'm wrong. I really hope I'm wrong. Uh, but I don't see the much of the stress really, it might calm down, but I don't see it ending for, for many, many months. This is gonna play out for a long time. There's just too many things happening that are gonna stress our day-to-day -day life. So we need to know that, we need to understand it. We need to figure out how it particularly plays on our thinking, feeling, our acting, on our mental health plays on each of us individually. Each of us have an individual response. Uh, each of our children or the people responsible, responsible of an individual response. How do we work with that? How do we make sure everybody's doing their best, knowing that there'll be some bumps here and there, but we know that there's gonna be, we're gonna make an effort here to, to approach it as thinking as clearly and as best as we can. No matter what, when we talk about mental health, and, and actually we heard about a situation that we're gonna talk a little bit about a family that's been hit by, by a, a trauma, uh, there's stigma. Uh, we'd like to think that, in the, that it's gonna go away. Uh, I, I think it's not gonna go away. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, we all are very protective for good reasons, actually. We're all very protective of our emotions, of our feelings, about uh, what people think about us, how we're being judged. Are we strong? Are we not strong? Should I say something? Uh, what are, how are people going to react to that? Are they going to do the right thing? Look, all that, I think, piles up and comes into what we think of as stigma. That's natural. That's the way things are. But knowing that, and knowing that we probably all share it in some way or another, how do we reach out for help? How do we connect with each other? How do we make sure that there is a hand there when we need it, and that we are a team, a community, a village, and that when something happens like this, that we all can do this together. And that's kind of the, those are the ideas that we're pushing here, we're promoting, and those are the ideas behind our campaign. Um, and why we felt that we needed to be proactive and why we started now last March and trying to reach out to all the people that most we're worried about on the front lines that we're gonna be feeling the impact of the stress of COVID and all the other things that were happening. Next slide, please. Now, uh, I like an approach as a child and adolescent psychiatrist of uh, thinking about sort of what is, uh, hold on here, so I'm being pinged to death and I wanna tell this guy that I'm on a conference call. Uh, Thanks, my apologies, but I needed to kind of. Um, so you may ask like, why would an army psychiatrist, uh, particularly someone who ended up as a general as I did, uh, become a child and adolescent psychiatrist? Well, because when I came in in 1970 and even now with the volunteer army, we were recruiting 18 year olds and 19 year olds. We were drafting them. Uh, they're teenagers, they're adolescents, and they're young adults. And they were serving, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. And I felt that if I was gonna be most effective 
as a leader, I needed to understand how uh, my team, and I felt responsible, they weren't just the soldiers who served under me, it was my team. I needed to know best how that, what, what, what were those people thinking? How did they think? How did they manage their day-to-day -day life? What were their, what was going on inside of them uh, that would help me uh, figure out uh, what were the challenges they were facing as they were gonna go into combat and all the fear and stress and worry about, about this situation that was literally life-threatening. So that's how it seemed to me the best way to do that was to look at what is the normal development? What happens to us as we uh, go through the various stages of our lives uh, from infancy to uh, towards the, those years, uh, 80, 90 years old, as we kind of come to the close of our lives. And I thought that uh, the best person to, that framed that, one of the smartest people that I, it was one of my teachers, was Eric Erickson. He's a social psychologist, uh, psychoanalyst, and I know that Dr. Gerber knows him and, is, and, and obviously he's more scholarly than I am, can speak, speak to it. But I, I felt that Erickson really explained that and that you could look at, as I want people to see here, uh, you can see you've got infants, toddlers, preschoolers, grade school people. We've got a question from a parent of a six-year-old. So how am I going to talk to my six-year-old? Well, the question is, what's going on with a six-year-old? What are the things that are important? How do they worry? What do they think about? What lights them up? What's most important in terms of their playmates? How do they think about authority? How do they understand an event? particularly a traumatizing event like this. Then as we get to, to, un, to be able to have a good picture of that, then we're better able to figure out how to talk to them. And then as the children grow older and uh, they be, they're you know, through grade school and they hit puberty and all the things are happening in puberty, I mean, and their bodies are changing and their hormones are raging and they're trying to figure out and one day they're children, one day they're adults, uh, one day they can grasp something, they understand it. And we wonder like, well, why can't they understand something else? Uh, again, how do we able it, how do we effectively engage them and talk to them about an event such as this, or if not, at least open ourselves up to know when they're showing their worries and anxieties uh, so that we can talk to them in most effectively. Understanding that we're all going through our phases of life as well, that uh, we're going through a stage as uh, parents or as career people, maybe in the prime of our careers or a particular point that we're really, as we would say in the army, gunning, and we're trying to move ahead, you know, how we focus, what's most important there, how we handle problems, how our peers handle problems, what's the language we use in ourselves, because we've got to understand ourselves We've got to understand how we manage stress and how we manage pressures, because that's clearly going to inform how we talk to our children, our students, or those people that depend on us. Not only is it going to inform how we do things, but it's also what we uh, project to them and what they see and therefore what they wonder how we handle something and therefore, is that something of the way that they should handle that? Uh, there's a lot here to unpack, and there's a lot to discuss, discuss here. I think it's fundamental in terms of talking and figuring out how to handle particularly stresses. And in some ways, there's so much here that we might do better in a Q&A and understand that in, a, in our Q&A, when one of you asks a question of a particular situation, we can refer to this and then you be, we all begin to think about how we problem solve, because this is what we're doing. 
is we're problem solving. There's some techniques, there's some tactics here, but basically what we're trying to do is problem solve. Next slide. So this breaks that, what I was just uh, talking about, breaks it down a bit more. Um, and uh, what, in terms of how you're gonna respectively talk to your children as you think about what age they're at. Uh, so that not surprisingly, uh, you know, that a preschooler is, um, is looking at their learning certain initiatives, you know, first graders, it's all about their initiative, how they meet other children. And understandably, there's some fear and anxiety in, in, in a preschooler. And um, yet to be able to, you can't necessarily talk to them in the way that you think we would talk amongst adults. We're really needing to look and see how is it showing up? Are they having trouble at night sleeping? Are they having some bad dreams? Do they worry about it? Are they worried about parents being mean? And what do we as parents do when that happens, which is basically just comfort them. I mean, we're not at, at the preschool and the early school ages, I'd say to about a, a time that a child is eight or nine years old, they think in what we call association. There's not a logical way, sort of a linear way of going from one step to the next. What they do is associate one thing with another thing. So most important, they wanna know that when they're frightened and anxious, that they're gonna be comforted. And um, because they don't learn rules until they're about eight or nine years old, uh, which is probably why we don't teach them arithmetic until third or fourth grade. Then these children could start to learn some rules. They understand that one thing, there's causation, one thing leads to another. And then something happens and you can then give a simple, straightforward explanation. Oh, in this particular case, I think we know that we really don't know. We just know that sometimes something that is frightening happens and basically being able to tell a child, hey, you're safe. This is not that situation. This kind of thing happens, you're safe. Which is different than what happens when these kids become teens. And now they're trying to figure out where do they fit? How do they make their identity? What's important? How do, where their attention comes from? What is that intention? What are the values there as they become teens? We've got a situation where we can have, I think, a deeper conversation. But then again, you know, each one of these children is different and it's a, it's a different way that they're gonna be, we're gonna talk to them. Uh, so I uh, would say to you that, that we've got a framework, but most importantly, as you all know, uh, underlying this, probably the most important thing is what is the rapport or the relationship with each of these children? What's, how am I relating to my children? How do I relate to the people that care for me? What is it about my personality that people like? feel comfortable with it? What is it about my personality that they don't feel comfortable with? What am I good at in being able to say and explain? What am I not good at? And how do certain children at certain ages react to me? And that's something we can explore again with each one of you. So next slide. Matt, I'm not sure which slide I'm on. I know that at about slide eight, we're gonna turn it over to Dr. Gerber, which what's the number here? All right, I'm five. All right. So, what I want to do is, um, is uh, as we think about this, talk about anxiety and talk about a stress that uh, occurs because they're different. Uh, this incident, tragic incident, is a stressor. It's traumatizing and we'll talk, uh, and in that sense, it's a shock. For most people, it's like we can't understand it. Um, it's a surprise. And so we're left with 
trying to work out a response that's going to be most helpful for us and for the people around us. Uh, it, uh, it, it does a stress has a natural life to it. That is in some ways it can go away. Um, it has a resolution. Uh, there's days that we think better about it. We could figure out how to solve it. There's days that it, we seem to be reminded and there's triggers and we don't know how, uh, why we are particularly uh, now following ourselves, ruminating or thinking about it. But there's a stress and this is a particular stress. It's frightening, it's an incident and being able to explain it as much as we can ends up being very important to managing stressors. That's different than generalized anxiety and uh, what you see on the left part of your screen here. Because I think what's happened in the past 15, 18 months, we've been living in a world of much anxiety. We don't know, we're just worried. Our lives, our habits have changed, our routines have changed. Uh, every day it's kind of what's gonna happen. We don't know where something might or might not happen. We worry about, are we healthy? Are we doing the right things? That leads to a very broad and encompassing feeling of anxiety, all of which really requires us to be able to come up with coping strategies. Much of the program that we've put together and that, we've, that Matt can also talk to you is how you just day to day, knowing that you're in a situation that no matter what is tough, that you're facing this, these kinds of problems every day, how do you as, at least cope with it as best as you can, keep yourself focused, keep your state of mind as best and healthy as you can and go about in a day-to-day -day way most effectively. That's managing your anxiety. That's a little bit different than managing your stress. Um, and, you know, we've got, uh, we had a, a question also from a, uh, a couple of, of participants were saying, look, uh, our families are going through some tough times. There's divorces and things, those things go on for a long time. Uh, that situation causes anxiety. Then a stressor occurs. And then you have to say, oh, let me focus on the stressor, talk about what the tools are, what the tactics are for managing it, knowing that this anxiety and worry about what's happening is always going to be there. So in fact, with this incident, we're in the middle where would both of these things happen? And we can lose sleep over it. And is it because we're anxious or is it because all of a sudden we've been frightened by the event? We've got a lot of worry. All that is the day-to-day -day conversation. And the best of course, is that it's open and we're, and we're, the, and we're as authentic. And that's so important. We're as authentic as we can be in talking about it, talking about our own stress and anxiety or being aware of it. We don't want to necessarily communicate it all to our children, but we need to be aware of it so we know because it gets conveyed and then being able to talk to them. Next slide, please. So that's, the, if there's some building blocks here uh, these are the building blocks. Is first, do a scan. I think all of us as parents, as adults, as teachers, as helpers, uh, first start to do a scan of saying, where are my stressors? Where is my anxiety? What is my typical way of dealing with it? How do I project it? How do I convey it? And then when in fact I've, someone seems to be triggered by it or bothered by it, what do I do most effectively that diffuses it, that calms it down? And you could almost do that on a spreadsheet, on a piece of paper and identify each one of those stressors and anxieties that are unique to me, are unique to your situation and then and we go down the 
down the series here, then almost say the same thing about your children. What are the things that stress your children? What lights these children up? What makes them most uncomfortable? And what do we know calms them down the best? Because we have to do the things that we know and that we can rely on that calms ourselves and calms our children. And then in that middle section here is what I've talked about is there are some routines. There are some things we can do day to day to manage our stress or manage our anxiety, particularly when we're in a, in a tough situation. Uh, most importantly is we all have problems with sleeping when we're really anxious and there's some tactics here. Uh, and it's all been talked about in terms of cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia. There's some tactics here for managing your sleep, daily exercise, regular routine, diet, all these things that are so important for managing your stress and anxiety. So then the next slide. Uh, and to emphasize what I've tried to say here is keep your eyes and ears open, most important. Uh, figure out, you know, be as observant and, and in that sense, be as not judgmental, just strictly observant and descriptive of what am I seeing, what's going on in my child, uh, before I even make a judgment about what it might cause and where it might be going or what it might be doing. And in terms of that, there's just a compassion. We just understand that we're all in this. Each of us has got a unique way of doing it. Sometimes, unfortunately, things rub badly between folks. We know that things rub badly between parents and children, between adults. We just are compassionate about it. We try to be understanding about it. And in that way, we're gonna do everything we can to normalize it. This is what happens. We're in a tough situation. It's been tough for a long time. Now we've had this, it can light things up. You know, it opens up literally a can of worms. We know that, but we're gonna talk about it. We're gonna do everything we can. Things are gonna get better. We're gonna be okay. Set good expectations, be positive, and let's, and let's make, be there to hold hands with each other and support each other. So with that, now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Gerber, and then I think we'll have some Q&A and further conversation. Andrew. Thanks, Dr. Zanakis, and, and uh, um, good evening, everybody. Maybe we can go to the scene in, in just a, a moment. Um, you know, I wanted to start by thanking uh, Elaine and Valerie for inviting me and the other members of the Silver Hill team, Dr. Zanakis and Tara and Matt, uh, to speak with you all uh, this evening. Uh, you know, it's obviously a very somber and tragic occasion, um, but it's also a privilege to, to be able to talk with you and a real privilege to have been able to work with Dr. Zanakis, uh, Tara and Matt over this last year. Um, as, as I think uh, Dr. Sanakis uh, let you know, you know, over a year ago, um, he and I had this conversation as COVID was really starting to hit. And, and I've been fortunate uh, to have a chance to collaborate with Dr. Zanakis pri uh, um, uh, previously. And uh, he was one of the first people I reached out to as I started to realize what was going on in, in, in the country and in the world. And um, just I've learned so much for, for, from you, Steve, and, and from your experience. And uh, I just am so grateful for, for your, your generosity in sharing um, your experience um, uh, and knowledge with all of us. Uh, it, it's a time when it reminds me how, how much we need the folks like you who understand trauma and understand it in an organizational and a public health level, because uh, even those of us who, you know, there's lots of years of training uh, in psychiatry. We're primarily trained around individuals, and this is a society level event. This is a world level event, and and that and that um, uh, means something. Um, there's no question in my mind that, that what we're here talking about tonight, this this tragedy in Westport, is linked to the broader crisis we are having in mental health, and it's something Dr. Zanak has said to me when we first spoke back in. March of last year, which is that the mental health implications of the COVID crisis are, are in some way only beginning. 
this is a multi-year event. And, you know, as people were saying back in, you know, last summer, oh, the worst is over and, you know, the vaccines are coming. And I, I remember you saying to, to me and, and to all of us, that's great. It's great that we're going to get the infectious disease aspects under control, but we haven't really started to appreciate the mental health aspects. And I, and I, and I do see these events as, as very linked. So that's the first thing I wanted to say. Uh, and, and just to thank you and everything you've done on behalf of Silver Hill and, and our community. The second thing I wanted to say was, was a bit more personal, which is even though I work in New Canaan, I live in Weston. Uh, I'm just, just about a mile and a half from the border with Westport. And in fact, the, the, the house where this tragedy occurred um, is, something I is, is something I pass almost every day. And I have two daughters, uh, one a teenager and one a preteen. And um, uh, they learned about the event almost the same time I did through, through the same route that I imagine uh, many of you or, or your children learned about it, which is social media. And we are living in a time when um, information travels in, in a way that has certain advantages and has also some terrible disadvantages that, that, that young people get unvarnished and sometimes false information uh, very quickly before they or their families or their societies have necessarily known how to process it. And, uh, and, and I think that creates challenges that, that didn't exist as recently as 5, 10, and certainly not 20 or 30 years ago when, when uh, you know, we, we were younger. So, so, so I, I, um, I, I join all of you in, in, in being concerned about the impact on our children and having to sort of solve in real time these very difficult issues. So, so with that as, as a sort of uh, prelude, let me get into some of the specifics that, that Dr. Zanakis was just talking about with you, because I think that's exactly the right place to go, which is, is to support each other and to talk really about the developmental process, because that's how we're going to be most helpful to young people. Like Dr. Zanakis, I, I'm trained as a child and adolescent psychiatrist, and even when I'm treating adults, um, I, I'm thinking about where people fit in developmentally, because that's how we're gonna be most useful. The moment we assume that everybody's coming at this from the same place, we're gonna make a mistake. Everybody is different. And, and, and to make matters even a little more complicated, even children or adolescents of the same age are different. And we know this, right? We know this from our own kids, that a six-year-old uh, is not the same as every other six-year-old. Within, within a classroom, you have an enormous range of development at six, at 10, at 15, at 18. And so those developmental stages that Dr. Zanak has shared with you from Eric Erickson, which are truly timeless. I mean, they're so, they were developed, you know, 60, 70 years ago, and they're still relevant. Um, kids fit into different stages at different ages. And sometimes they go forward and sometimes they go backwards. And in times of great stress like COVID or this tragedy, you, it is not unusual to see kids slide back into some of the challenges that you may have thought that they had mastered a, a, a year before. It's not unusual for adults to slide back into some of those challenges. So, so I, think, I think getting to know them, and I know it's a lot of material to absorb all at once, but I hope you'll look at those slides, you'll read about Erickson's stages, you'll, re, you'll, you'll review some of what Dr. Snakis has already said, and use that as you're thinking about your own reactions to, the, to this tragedy, as well as, as those of your kids. So let me get to the, to the slides in front of you, though, because I am eager to get it back to you all for, for a Q&A. Um, I think that if, if whoever could go back one more, I think there was one previous. Sorry, okay, you can go forward again. Uh, I apologize, you, you covered that. So, so the first thing I want to talk about is, um, is the warning signs, because as parents, and I assume, I assume most, if not all of you on this call are parents, you are the experts at your children, and you know when something is different. Pay attention to your gut, pay attention to your intuition, because while you know, this is a list of some of the things to worry about, distraction, anxiety, fear, hopelessness, insomnia, nightmares, sadness, angry outbursts, and headaches, any parent uh, like me would say, wait a second, I've seen all those things in my children at various points. I've seen them in myself at various points. Does that automatically mean I, I need more support right now? Well, maybe. And the answer is these, this is the outline of some of the things you should be thinking about. 
but you should be paying most attention of all to the changes. If your child has struggled with some distraction, but it's not changed, okay, you don't have to worry about that one right now. But if your child never struggled with those things and is now struggling with them in the wake of either COVID or the tragedy that just occurred, that's worth paying attention to. Same with anxiety, same with hopelessness, same with insomnia. All of these are normal in some contexts and they're normal if they're brief and they're normal if they've been you know, part of a, of a normal developmental trajectory. It doesn't mean they're all good, but, but, but I wouldn't necessarily worry as much if I saw them as, as, as existing for, for some time before COVID or before the tragedy. But if they're new, if they just started and they're not getting better or going away, that's when I urge you to reach out for help. If your gut tells you this is different, this is not the way your kid had been before, reach out for help. If you're not sure, if your child is saying things that confuse you or they're complaining about something that doesn't seem to you to, to match up with your experience, reach out for help. Because kids and adults for that matter, but especially kids, present in all sorts of different ways. We can't always explain why one kid develops nightmares and another kid uh, develops anger. One kid develops headaches and another kid develops anxiety. There's, there's no rhyme or reason in some sense. Maybe someday we'll understand the brain bases for all these things. But for right now, uh, pay attention to changes and pay attention to problems that don't go away or are on the wrong trajectory that is going uh, getting worse. Three months is not some sort of gold standard, but it's not a bad rule of thumb. If something has not resolved in three months, definitely reach out for support. But you shouldn't wait to three months. If you see something that's even going on for a few weeks or a month or month and a half, and it seems to be getting worse, not better, reach out for help. It makes sense to see some of these symptoms briefly, a week or two. If they're starting to get better, you're probably in good shape. But if not, don't, don't bear this burden alone. We, we are fortunate to live in an area, Westport, Weston, New Canaan, Fairfield County, uh, New York, Westchester in general, where the resources are profound. Now it is harder to get an appointment lately. It's been harder for the last year. We're seeing demand at the hospital that we've never seen in our, probably in our 90 year history. Um, but, but you can get resources. And I know that, that, that uh, uh, Valerie and Elaine have, have showed some of those resources at the beginning. You're always welcome to reach out to me and at Silver Hill, and, and, and we can help you find resources as well. If I could go to the next slide now. So much of this starts with a conversation, and I, and I think Dr. Stankis has already been, been talking about how do you genuinely be curious with your kids about what is going on? Uh, how to start that conversation is a big piece of this, because what you don't want to do is assume that you know where they're at. That is, assume that you know what they've heard, how they've reacted, even what they've taken in. And, and it, kind of a rule of thumb in, in, in working with, to some extent, all people, but certainly kids, is that you could be in the same place, experiencing the same thing, hearing the same news story on TV. And what you hear is not necessarily what the person or the child sitting next to you hears. So before you make an assumption and say things like, can you believe you know, that? Or you must be so upset because we just saw that or heard that. Instead of assuming that, ask the question. So a question like this, how do you feel about what's happening? Keep it open, keep it vague at first. You can always get more detailed later, but the problem is you can't dial it back. Once you've gotten into the details and then realize that they didn't actually appreciate, you didn't, they didn't actually hear those details, even though you thought they did, it's too late to go back at that point. But if you start open-ended, what are you thinking about in terms of the situation, right? Keeping it very general. Are you and your friends talking about not the murder, not the whatever, but what happened? That gives you a chance to hear what they're saying and talking about and not to make assumptions about it. Even just a, just a statement like, I'd be really interested in hearing what you think, opens the door. Now, we all know our kids in different ages, they may not immediately get into it. They may, you know, shrug their shoulders or say, I don't know what you're talking about. That's okay. You can give them some time. And the last item on this really nice list, let me know if you want to talk, is an open-ended invitation that they may not take up that day or that hour or even that week. Um, you know, 
I don't think you should leave it just at one mention of that. But if you're letting your kids know that you you appreciate that this is a tough time, COVID and other things, and you give them that space, they'll often come to you and then you know where to get started because they're coming to you. And when they come to you and say, I'm really upset or I'm having nightmares or you know, I'm, I, I, I'm terrified, don't assume you know why. Say, well, tell me about what's going on. What, what are you feeling? What are you hearing? And, and, and I think that's a great way to kind of launch you down the right path. Let's go to the next slide now. I mentioned you know, some things you want to avoid, like you want to avoid assuming you know where, where kids are coming from or what they've heard. And even with my own kids, I can tell you, they may have looked at the same TikTok, but one of my kids takes something very different away than the other. So you need to really talk to them separately about it. But the other thing I, I want you to avoid is once you know what they're hearing or seeing, um, uh, and they've told you, well, I saw this on TikTok, or I saw, uh, my friend told me that this happened, or, you know, uh, um, he here's what I heard. You want to watch your own reactions, because we all have reactions, of course, and sometimes our reaction is to say things like, well, that's not true, or uh, don't think of it that way. Um, and when, while we can be directive with ourselves, and maybe to some extent with other adults, it's important to not be directive with kids or to tell them what to think or feel. Um, because A, it doesn't particularly work and you probably know this, but, but second of all, it, 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 it assumes that you know how they should be coping. And the risk is that you create a, this is the way it should be uh, about a reaction. And if that's not the way they're feeling, they can then actually end up feeling worse, not better. So for example, saying something uh, um, that minimizes it and says, well, it's, it's, it's the, you know, they didn't really die, they're sleeping or they went away. Uh, it, it, if, if you happen to get it right and that's exactly where they are, terrific. But if you got it wrong and that's not where they are, they could experience that as you uh, um, whitewashing or minimizing or underestimating what, the, what, they're, uh, what they're feeling. If you say, well, you didn't know that person or you never met them, so it couldn't affect you. You, you don't know. And sometimes people have traumatic reactions to things that didn't happen to anybody they know, but because of, of what it reminded them of or what it sounded like, and they may not be able to articulate all this. Adults can't even articulate it. Certainly kids can't always articulate it. You don't know how that's gonna affect them. And, and I'd be very careful in assuming that. I would wanna listen to them and meet them when, when they're at. And last, I, I don't think we should ever be in the business of prescribing a time frame. There is no right or wrong. It should be a week or it should be two weeks or it should be a month. People react differently to these things and you have to meet kids and adolescents where they're at. Now, that doesn't go against what I said earlier, which is that if it's going on too long or going in the wrong direction, yes, you wanna reach out for help. This is our job as professionals. We're trained in working with, with kids and adolescents and young adults about this. So I wouldn't wait too long there, but I wouldn't tell your child or tell your, your adolescent that there's a right or wrong way to, to react because that actually can end up doing more, more harm than good. Um, you know, th there was a question that came to us before and I'll, I'll end on this before turning it back to, to Dr. Zanakis and, and, and then opening it up for questions. A question came to us about a seven-year-old and uh, what I wanted to first say is that seven-year-olds are not all the same. And before one would assume what you should or shouldn't say to a seven-year-old about what happened, the first recommendation I would make is ask that seven-year-old some of these questions that I mentioned earlier. Ask them what they know. Ask them what they heard and what their reaction is. And then once you hear that, you're learning about where they are reacting developmentally and, and you're then being able to meet them where they are and talk with them about it at the level of detail that they're sharing. Don't add to the detail unnecessarily. In fact, I was not thrilled with some of the ways that the newspapers depicted these stories using graphic details that are truly unnecessary. And um, I hate to say it, I hope nobody thought this, but maybe inadvertently they thought it sold papers, but that's not a reason to share some of the details. Uh, we don't really know what directly happened in that case. We know it was a tragedy, 
Um, we, we know that, that, that uh, horrible things happen in, in the context of awful stress, and we've got to be empathic. Once we make things black and white and we decide we know this or we know that or we're talking about the details, at, at that point, I, I think we're, we're really doing more harm than good. So I keep things vague. I'd hear what they know. I'd address things at the level that they're bringing them to us and then move things in the direction of how you can be helpful, how they can be helpful and how to make them feel safe. I'll end on that with just really a, a reiteration of something Dr. Zanakis I think said that's so wise. Human beings respond more than anything else and kids more than anybody to the emotion that they're feeling from their loved ones and their parents. And if what they are experiencing is that, is that it's going to be okay, you're going to be safe, this will not happen to you, they can handle almost anything. If what they experience is panic, is anger, is, uh, oh my God, this could be us tomorrow, they're gonna have a terrible reaction, you know, even if that's illogical. And, and so I, I encourage you as parents and, and as, as members of the community to work on yourselves first, you know, pull that oxygen mask down in, in, in the plane before you put it on somebody else, make sure you know how you're metabolizing these horrible events, and then you're in the best position to create that safe environment for your children and for your other loved ones, okay? Let me stop there and, and, and turn it back to Dr. Zanakis and uh, hope we can take some questions. Uh, thanks, Andrew. And so wise, I think you've you hit things right, just right in the right voice. And as a parent, in terms of being able to explain, of course, what we know that all our children are different and they've got, you know, as we all have different strengths and weaknesses. Uh, that we had some questions. I thought that we could, as a start here, and I would hope then we can continue is talk about some questions that were presented to us as good case examples. And then anybody else that wants to ask something, uh, respect their uh, privacy or anonymity. Um, and I want to take the first one, and then I've asked Andrew to talk about uh, two, two others who came to us. Um, because I think this one has some good teaching points. Uh, a parent uh, asked us about the um, stressful event that happened to her children that is two children witness the sudden death of a sibling. And um, two children were, did not witness it directly. And uh, the two children who did not witness it have gotten into therapy. She says, I, I don't know what to do for the two children that did witness this. Uh, I, I will tell you, I think that's a, there's a lot to unpack with that because it reminds me of something that we've seen in soldiers for many, many years and uh, what the art is of being able to engage people in terms of helping themselves. Yeah. The first is that we were saw, we probably more often than not, that a soldier who, experiences right there, the death of a fellow soldier or comrade uh, is probably in some ways the most reluctant to talk about it. Everybody thinks that it has a lot to do with stigma and macho, perhaps. I think what we need to also pay attention to is when something like that, it is so shocking. When an incident like this happens, and we're shocked by it, we don't have words. We don't have a way of understanding it right when it happens. And clearly, even as we think we're, 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 we're trying to figure it out, we can't put words to it. Add to that that because we can't put words to it, we couldn't explain when it happened and we couldn't explain as it goes on, we keep feeling bothered by it and our stress response syndromes are triggered more every time we think about it. So we feel worse about it. And our natural way to handle something like that is to avoid it. We see that 
all the time in our soldiers. And of course, they feel worse. They have more problems with sleep. They have more anxiety. They have problems concentrating. They have problems in their family relationships and their, with their intimate partners. All this gets worse. What we found that works is to get them engaged in something that is that is nonverbal because this is this happens at a pre-verbal nonverbal status like art and you would not think that soldiers would particularly take to doing art but that in fact is a way that they can now express once they start doing it in a safe place they're able to express themselves or music or pets or sports or activity so one of the things I think in terms of a, a point here, building on what Dr. Gerber said and my own personal experience is understand that and that find an experience for that child or that person you're trying to work that is comfortable in that way, but that is also ex expressive and links to the trauma that they experience. And I personally, I can tell you, I have two children. They're now much older. Uh, when they were young teenagers, their mother was very sick. I found that for my son, more intellectual, he and I used to watch the old television, the Star Trek series. That movie, that every, that the television show helped us talk about things because it was really wonderfully scripted. Our daughter, the soccer player, it was all about sports. And we could use that as a way of, of engaging and talking about things. So we found a situation that they were comfortable in, a way that was doing that, and then we would explore that. And if something was bothering them, that's when it would, we'd finally, it would come out and we'd be able to work it in some way. So I, I, I want to emphasize that thinking about developmentally, think about what is the natural way that your child or the person you're trying to help ex experiences things, engages their mind, and it may not be in words. It may be something else entirely. And you kind of need to literally to be sitting with them and let that come out. And I think this is the kind of situation uh, where with good broad treatment, we're able to do that. Um, so that's, to me, a, an example here uh, that builds, it applies these principles. There are two other cases and I would, um, and I would now defer to Andrew. One was a mother who said, look, my child went to the school where the seven-year-old attended. What's gonna happen when we return? How do I talk to, to that child? And the other of an older child who I think getting into middle school, what's gonna happen there and how are kids gonna talk about it? They're gonna get back in September. I think there's a lot uh, that's got to be thought through and, and worked on here. So I, Andrew, maybe maybe you can talk to that better since your children are younger, you know. Sure, them. I mean, I'll, I'll just sort of, you know, um, mention and I talked a little bit about this before that, that you know, I would I would treat kids of, of different ages, or or even if they're not of different ages, separately. So in the case that was brought up, the seven year old had an older uh, sister, and the question was how to talk to them. I would say the first thing is have the conversation separately because um, there can be big differences uh, in kids, and uh, in, the, in this case, the older child had already heard and read about some of the details. So I think you have no choice but but to address what the older child had heard and, and at first ask, and then talk about it and talk about it in a calm and systematic way that, that, that gives, you know, don't add to the, the level of detail, but, but address it and, and convey a sense of, of sadness and, and tragedy and safety and moving on. Uh, and then the younger child, uh, first I'd find out what, what she knows. And, you know, you shouldn't assume that she heard it just because her older sibling did. Don't, even if she was in the room when, when the older sibling heard it, don't assume she absorbed it, uh, ask. And if she's showing some of the signs, 
If she brings up the detail, of course, go there. But I would not add to the level of detail that she knows. I'd address it the way she brings it up. Now, when school starts, you know, the, the questioner says, well, what, what if she hears more? She may. And, and, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't assume it now. I, I, would, I would wait and uh, I, would, I would follow and I would check in as you would do automatically about how was your day and what'd you hear and what's going on. Um, but but I, wouldn't, I wouldn't share details, you know, with the idea that, well, if she doesn't hear it from me, she's gonna hear it from everybody else. I would make sure she knows there's a tragedy, which she already does and, and involved uh, uh, um, uh, people dying, including, including a child. But, but that's, that, that's the level I would lead it, leave it at until she brings more. So, so that, that's, that's uh, um, my suggestion for now. But, but let's, let's open it up. And I don't know if, if Matt uh, uh, also had things he wanted to add, Steve. So, so whatever, whatever you think is best. I, I, Matt's got some things where we can talk about some of the training that we do for people to manage their stress and routines. Maybe we could close with that. I, I thought maybe at this point, unless Elaine, you've got some other thoughts. Um, why don't we just open it up to people's questions, uh, and then we'll let, and then we'll maybe close with some, some suggestions Matt does for all of us to be able to get through our days. So Elaine, do, are there other questions that have come to mind, or that people want to, us to talk about? Thank you very much. Uh, there is, um, and I don't know if Tara wanted to jump in. There is one. Um, more of a statement than a question in the chat, um, just speaking to the fact that um, there were some um, kids who were actually working on the ambulance that day um, that actually responded to the scene and just looking for some guidance on how to talk with your child when they have experienced something like this. Um, I know you addressed it earlier um, when you talked about you know, the other scenario that you had mentioned um, I don't know if you have anything further to say about that. I really love what you said about, you know, don't make assumptions about what they saw or what they felt, um, asking them the question, allowing them to tell their story from their perspective. Um, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. So how old are these children? I mean, Andrew, if you want to chime in, I just wanted to say, how old are these? Were they in a volunteer training status? Uh, uh, 15 years old. 15 year old who is working on the ambulance or uh, I'm assuming volunteer working service. on the ambulance. So they're yes. working the yes. volunteer service. Um, well, I'll say something and then Andrew can add in. Um, our, our routine, our typical routine is after something happened like that, um, I, I would often ask actually if I had a, depending on who the supervisor team leader was, and depending on kind of what their um, approach was to things, their mentality, um, I'd ask them to sit down with these the, the newbies, you know, basically the young folks and say, let's do a debriefing. We have this after action routine in the military and we use it for a lot of things, uh, a first combat you know, experience, a first of everything. But I always thought it was useful to get somebody who had been had some experience, but yet had had the right temperament to say, "Hey, look, let's talk through this. Here's what happened. How did this happen? Here's what you saw. Um, here's also what you should expect." Uh, and so that they're not surprised by it. Uh, that we all, after we've had something like this happen to us, the first time we've been in an incident that's life-threatening, traumatizing. Uh, if we've been lucky, we've had somebody talk us through, but then, you know, we don't sleep the night that night. We may not sleep the night afterwards. Uh, we may, you know, appetite. Uh, these kids at 15, hopefully they're not using alcohol. The older kids, I'd, you know, make sure that they're not gonna get drunk or something like that. Um, but I'd walk them through that and I'd, I'd say to them, look, here's what happens to all of us when this happens. And there'd be, and then for them to also understand that there might be something down the road that's a trigger uh, for this. So that's kind of how I would typically, typically do this kind of thing. 
And you know, you, you raise a really good point. My understanding is, is that all the first responders got immediate support um, after this incident. And it reminds me that, you know, there's varying, you know, everyone says, thinks of trauma as some big event, right? But you can be a part of a really significant trauma, loss of life type of situation. And then there's something I hear a lot about called vicarious trauma. Mm-hmm. Would either of you care to sort of address you know, is there a difference? Is trauma, is trauma the same? So I don't know if you had an opinion on that. I, I, um, I do have a lot of feelings about that. And again, I would defer to Dr. Gerber because he's such an excellent clinician. Um, work I do not only here in the US but in other countries, because I work a lot with refugees and other displaced people who have been victims of lots of them of torture and abuse. Um, I know that there's a reaction when you're the actual victim of it. And that mm-hmm. happens. Um, and then there's a, there's a reaction and, uh, and a problem when you're listening to somebody else tell you about it. Uh, and I think it's, it's slightly different. Uh, one, you're doing the best you can to empathize, be compassionate about that person, understand what's going on. You probably may be aware that you're relating it to other things that happened in your life, but it may not be exactly the same thing. So there's a, a bit of a, of a gap there, but it does remind you of, of things that happened in, in your life. And if it's not something that you directly experienced, then your mind, my find that my mind as I'm working with these people and other people that uh, my colleagues, our mind starts to race about all the other things that we might think link up to it. So it gets hard, you know, and, and, and that's the vicarious element of it because we're really, uh, it's not the right word, but I don't know how to put it. We're, we're really, we're we're really watching a movie, a bad movie, hor- terrifying movie, and which may not be the same as when we've been we've been the character in the movie, when we've been the ones who've been shot at. So there's a difference here, and I think it's very hard, and it's very hard for the therapist over time, as well, and their parents. Andrew, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that. You know, I'll just add a little bit. I mean, I, I think I think you really covered it beautifully, um, Steve. Uh, you, you know, I, I think um, if there's one thing I've learned from, from clinical experience, it, it's that um, people react in ways that you can't predict, and that uh, what what would traumatize one person is not necessarily what would traumatize somebody else. And if we bring our own lens and think, well, that's way worse than that, uh, we may be wrong. In fact, we're usually wrong because other people have have different reactions. And so one would think that there's a clear hierarchy that you could take traumas and and put them on, you know, a kind of continuum of, well, it's worse if you experienced it, it's worse if it was this. And and, and it turns out that it doesn't work that way, that, that sometimes what somebody sees vicariously, but didn't actually threaten their own lives, at least from an external point of view, was more terrifying than something that seemed to directly threaten them. So the only way you know is by watching. And, and, and the other thing I just wanted to add was, you know, I, I think all the interventions that have been discussed for, for the, the first responders and for everybody else are great. I'm so glad to hear that the EMS is doing it. Um, but of course, and maybe this is obvious, but, you know, mental health doesn't respond the way, um, you know, a, uh, a, a you know an infection that is you give some antibiotics, you did you gave the right one, it's it's gone and it never comes back. I wish mental health was that way, but but the brain is way more complicated, and sometimes you do exactly the right thing, you do the the right intervention, and it seems to be fine, and then a week later or a month later or a year later, uh, it pops up again for reasons that you couldn't have predicted. So you know, I, I say this not to terrify everybody and to think that you're you can never relax again. But to say that, you know, particularly with a 15 year old, I, I, would, I, I would watch and, and do the right things. You don't overdo it. 
And then you check in and you check in in a week and a few weeks and a few months. And, and if something pops up later, you don't say, well, that's, that doesn't make any sense. They, they seem fine. No, these things, these things sometimes pop up later. And, and that's okay. It doesn't, it's not necessarily a terrible thing. You, you, you just want to normalize it and then you want to deal with it when it pops up. So um, I'm, I'm, I didn't know, by the way, that, 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 that there were adolescents on that call. I'm sorry to hear that. And uh, I, I, I certainly you know, uh, want to make sure they, they get whatever support they need in, in, in case. And I wouldn't assume that they did have a traumatic reaction, but in case they did, I, I, I want to make sure they got to get the support they need. I do want to add one thing in terms of thinking about how these things, and Andrew's 100% right, that there's a almost a sort of a lifelong quality to these. These kinds of events are organizing. These, these kinds of events get imprinted into young people's minds particularly, but into all our lives. And they do make a difference about our attitudes, uh, decisions we make, all sorts of decisions that we make in terms of how uh, we lead our lives, uh, intimate partners, and all sorts of things like that, how we, in fact, then raise our own children. And it's really important to keep that in mind. Um, years ago, uh, there was a, um, a an incident that happened in California now probably about 45 years ago. And a teacher of mine was investigating it. Lenore Terre did a study of um, these young people, their, I don't know, what particularly got into their mind, hijacked a bus and buried the bus with the children. And um, in those days, people thought, well, okay, once we recover the bus, everybody was alive, it would all go away. And, and Dr. Tear very smartly realized that a year or two later, these children were having it, behavior problems and problems in school uh, that were linked to that and had not been discussed. Now, a lot's been done since then. That's how we get all the information that you all have used as resources is from the work that Lenore did, Lenore did. But the teaching point is that this is subtle and it really goes undercover and we need to keep our eyes and ears always open. Let me add something here and um, that makes it difficult uh, for you all parents. And I, I feel for you young parents, uh, Andrew mentioned TikTok and there are a host of other different uh, media. Uh, these, this, the availability of this media now sets up what I would, uh, what I think of as echo chambers that my kids 30 years ago did not have exposure to. And once a child, I've seen this in other young people, once a child gets in this echo chamber, it sets in place some all sorts of feelings and thoughts that may not ever get exposed or our parents may not be aware of. And there's got to be a way of being able to uncover that and, and open it up uh, because these are, this ends up really, I think, being can be very problematic as well. And, um, and there's not a, unfortunately, there's not a forum for people, for the, particularly the kids to get help with, from, uh, with that. So are there other questions or thoughts that we need to, to uh, talk about? I, I wonder if, um, you know, as you were talking, I wonder if anyone, if either of you or Matt has any um, kind of synopsis that you might share with us in regard to, you said a lot of really interesting things about, you know, being tuned into your kids and listening to them, um, you know, almost normalizing and accepting whatever thoughts or feelings that they're having. And you also talked about, um, you know, almost that cliche, right? It's okay not to be okay. Um, a lot of people are going through that. 
But as we think about the age span of the children that have been affected by the tragedy, do you have any, you know, one or two kind of synopsizing thoughts about, you know, regardless of your age or stage, you know, what are the things that parents can do, um, you know, today or tomorrow um, to help support their kids? I'm not good at school, but I'm going to just pick <laughs> one thing and I'm going to then kick it over to both Andrew and Matt. I personally think the best thing to do as a parent or someone who's in a situation you've got people relying on you to help is have a routine and mm -hmm. spend time with them. I mean, I really, look, I think you check in with everybody in the morning, you check in with them throughout the day, you do as much of it face to face. Uh, you, if you know, I you have a routine, maybe it's the army and me, meals are served at certain times, everybody's together and sits at the dinner table. Uh, you've got activities together. If you exercise and you exercise together, uh, I just like those kinds of regular routine stuff. And by doing those routines and everybody being face to face, then that that gives the best opportunity. And the, you know, the, the really opens it up that, that if there's going to be the, for the best communication and for the best way of handling things. So that's my, that's my default as a, as an army officer and recovering parent, but I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to Andrew and, and Matt's got a whole bunch of things that he can talk about as well. I, 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 lo I love your, your, your uh, take home uh, Steve. I love lists of three, so I'll give you three. Um, my, my three are um, take care of yourself first, put on your own oxygen mask before you take your, uh, 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 put the mask on your kids. Um, and number two is don't assume, ask um, when you're interacting. And number three is when in doubt, reach out for some added support and help. Matt? Great, thank you so much. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know if I could say it much better than that. I think the only thing that I would add maybe as like the cherry on top would be um, to model the type of behavior that you want to see in your kids, right? So whether that is um, seeking support when you need it or being honest about your emotions or whether you're confused about your emotions, uh, having those kind of honest conversations, I think is a, uh, is a great first step as well. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, I don't see any other questions and unless any of the other panelists have anything that they want to add. Well, I, you know, thought I just saw a question in the Q&A, uh, which I'd be happy to take. It's a very thoughtful question oh, there by, we go. by someone who mentioned that even as an adult, they feel bothered and saddened, which, which of course makes sense. And I, and I think something that I imagine uh, uh, all of us would share. Uh, and, and the challenge that the person says, well, how do you, how do you talk to some another adult about this who doesn't know about it? And I think that is a that is a challenge because I, you know, frankly, I I I, I think if you don't uh, know that you're going through a trauma, other people can't uh, um, uh, support in that same way. So so my suggestion is to to find somebody who who do, is familiar with this and and support each other. And if it, there is somebody you're close to who doesn't know, I, I think it's fine to say that you just learned about a really traumatic event. You don't have to go into all the details, but you can talk about, uh, um, you, you know, uh, people dying at that and, and learning about the, these, these sad circumstances in, in which obviously overwhelmed people die um, and, uh, and, and talk about what it means to you and, and somebody who you care about is gonna be able to support you in that. So I, I, I think, you know, the, the virtue of being an adult is you can expect other people to be able to take care of themselves. You know, I wouldn't reach out to a child, obviously, and expect them to understand. But, but an other adult, you can do that. And, and if there's nobody out, then, then reach out and, and, and find somebody. There's so many people in our community who, who are there for support. And I, and I think you should never feel embarrassed that you're having that reaction. It is a human reaction to be very upset by this event. Such a good point. Thank you so much. And I think one of the things that we'll try and do after the presentation is we will, um, we have recorded it. So we will make that available to the community. Um, and, you know, 
something you said, Dr. Gerber, is um, you know it really does live in the community now. Um, the, the, the timing of this incident in particular with the end of school has made it very difficult for parents, teachers, counselors, really everybody um, to come together and sort of process what happened. And so this was sort of a, a small step that we're taking at the community level to let people know that, that we're all in this together. And so, um, you know, we are trying as a community to um, be sure that we're open and honest and that the resources are available. And I know some people might not wanna pick up the phone and dial a, a, a text crisis line um, they might not feel like they're in that place, but they could really use a, a warm ear. And so I want to remind people that um, we're, uh, we're here in human services. We have several clinical staff members who are available to um, put you in touch with the appropriate resources as necessary. Um, that um, we will continue to work with the schools. Um, this isn't something that we're just going to say, oh, that was last week and we're still not concerned because we are. Um, I know that um, Dr. Babich is on the call and, um, you know, we will continue to brainstorm and think about ways we can support the community. I want to invite anybody, they can comment in the Q&A or you can email me directly if you would like to, um, if you're interested in some kind of group support, we can absolutely make that happen. The Center for Hope is a great option. Um, they run a lot of uh, support groups around grief and loss for children. Um, I have a whole, there was a whole PowerPoint um, at the beginning that shared all sorts of resources, which we'll also make available on several different websites. We have positive directions. We have the wonderful staff at Silver Hill Hospital. So I, I wanted to just thank you for taking the time. And if anybody feels that they need to stay after, we will keep open for a little while longer and you can feel free to post anonymously in the chat if you have specific questions that you'd like answered. It's 829 now, we'll probably stay on for like another five or 10 minutes just to be sure. And in the meantime, um, I believe Deirdre posted in the chat, if you wanna reach out to human services, you have ideas or um, something that you feel like we could help answer, please don't hesitate to give us a call at 341-1050. And I want to just thank you again, Dr. Zanakis, Dr. Gerber, Matt, Tara, um, Alex, of course, in the library, Dr. Babich and Deirdre um, for, for spending the time with us today and just um, also making that very generous offer of, you know, we may choose to do a lunch and learn or something like that again later, um, just based on what we're hearing from the community. So please don't be shy and let us know how you're feeling, what you're thinking, and how we might be able to work together. Um, so with that, I will just say thank you. Um, uh, Margaret Watt from Positive Direction says thank you as well. Um, but we are a community. We're all in this together, and we're happy to help wherever needed. So um, with that, I say thank you to everybody who joined us today. We will stay on for just a minute or, you know, maybe four or five minutes longer, just in case. Um, but don't hesitate to reach out if you need anything at all. So thank you. Thanks so much, Elaine. Thanks, yeah, everybody, for joining. It was terrific. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, people are slowly hopping off. So yeah, just in case, we'll hang around for a little while. I thought that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Oh, good. Yeah, look, I mean, uh, let us know. I mean, any any feedback you get or anything, people, ideas, suggestions, things we could do differently, just let us know. I mean, we're, 